Hopefully you're already at Matthew chapter two. We're going to finish out our Advent series uh, really with three promises. But what I want to tell you is something really crazy. We celebrate Christmas like hard in our house. We watch every Christmas movie. In fact, really after Thanksgiving, I'll put up the lights outside. We do Christmas tree inside. There's a rule. We have to wait really toward Thanksgiving, like right after Thanksgiving to actually decorate the tree. But we have everything, like our halls are decked. It's crazy. Christmas in our house is only Christmas music, only Christmas decorations, only Christmas TV. Um, I heard Pastor Chris last week as I was listening to the sermon talk about the office. We do the office parks and rec. We thank thankful for Peacock. They have a load of things that you can just watch right through. Uh, we watch everything, Christmas movies. It's, that's really the rule in my house in December. It's only Christmas. You're not allowed to watch. We even have to find Paw Patrol that are Christmas movies, like theme episodes. Um, and it doesn't always work, but I try my best to like create this environment in our house to where Elf is a reality for us, you know, and we're doing all those things. It's so bad that I want to tell you something that's really interesting. I waited four days for a 20 foot Santa Claus to go on sale. Um, I went to the store and it was, it was a lot of money and I was like, I can't, I can't do this to my family, but I, but I want to. And so I called Tracy and I, I had a whole bunch of uh, presents, or not presents, they were just decorations. I had them up at the store and the lady says, do you know that on the 15th, if you're a rewards member, all of this is 50% off? And I said, well, you realize that I'm not gonna buy any of this now. I'm gonna come back on the 15th. So I came back and I, there was one Santa Claus left. And I love the real story of Santa. I love Santa, like historically, I think it's, he's one of the coolest people in church history. Uh, the one that I was getting did not represent him well and he's 20 feet. So I put him on there and it doesn't ring up 50%. And I'm like, no, I'm getting this for 50% off. So the manager comes up, gets it to me, we put it in the cart. I actually call Tracy. Tracy will tell you that she's not into Christmas like me and it's a lie. She might even be a little bit more, but it is embarrassing for a woman to have the 20 foot Santa outside their house. I get that, I get that. So I bring it home, I go to work, 11 o'clock at night, Addie and I are setting up a 20 foot Santa. Uh, we don't strap it down at first because I just wanna see what it looks like and how big it is. That was a mistake, the wind was blowing. We are grabbing onto it like the Macy's Day Parade. The Santa like going this and poor Addie is looking like she's gonna get pulled away by this giant Santa, uh, which is more like Krampus. It was a whole thing. So uh, the, crazy, the crazy moment in our house, I just want you to know how, how nuts we go when Mariah Carey finally thaws out. Like it gets ridiculous. And it's always been like that. Since I was a kid, it's always been like that. I've always loved everything goes. My nickname in our house, especially around this time of year, is Clark Griswold for a reason. And I, like one of my favorite things to do is sit down with my kids, and we're going to do it tonight, and we'll watch Charlie Brown's Christmas, and it's got this amazing scene in it where Charlie Brown is stuck just like we are with all the chaos and distractions and everything else, and he finally is putting on, he's the Christmas play director and he finally gets frustrated and he looks around and he says, does anyone know what Christmas is all about? It has this really cool scene in it. And Linus gets up and he says, I know what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. And I never noticed till I was reading an article probably about four years ago, I never quite noticed uh, that he, is, he has an attachment with his blanket, that's obvious, but I never noticed that when he was reading Luke chapter two, he drops his blanket. And ever since then, I was like, man, that's the most incredible moment, I think, in TV history that may be overstating things. But it's unbelievable where you watch Linus step up and he quotes Luke chapter two, and no matter who you are, like it's this incredible moment, and he drops his blanket because I'd, I'd heard that and then I went back and I watched it. I was like, he actually does. He loses the one thing that he holds for security, he, he loses it. And it's, it's unbelievable that that has stuck with me since I've ever noticed it and I've watched it for years. I mean, since I was a child. And it got me thinking, this incredible thing like 
What really, what, what do we celebrate at Christmas? What do you really celebrate at Christmas? This story shows us almost uh, the weirdness of Christmas where Jesus is born, the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah is born, and then all of a sudden there's a threat to his death immediately. And God protects him, not for what you think. He doesn't just simply protect Jesus. There's a crazy, beautiful purpose in God's protection of his son. And the reality is he protects him so that he might die. The father actually acts in protecting his son against all of the things that happen in order that he might ensure that he dies for our sins at the right time so that the son accomplishes a work for us we can never do for ourselves. He actually takes something of substance so that God protects Jesus in order that he might die on the cross at the right time. So in a sense, uh, the reason that you can really reflect and rejoice and celebrate Christmas is because Christmas is just as much about the death of God as it is the life. And I bet we don't think that way. I bet we, we don't wake up and go, man, we're so thankful for the death of God. And yet that's the very reason we actually celebrate. It's not the birth. And Jesus was born to die. And so Matthew takes a beautiful approach for us. As we read this story, as if you're reading it the first time, there's, there's this great threat and it's a wicked king. And as he, as he goes after the son of God, who he's so fearful of that he's gonna lose his kingdom and he, and he will lose his kingdom, but he's so fearful that this other kingdom is gonna replace his. He does everything that you think you would want to do and yet he misses and he misses and he misses. And, and that's the beauty of it. With, with Christmas, like all that we do, all that we get excited about in the reality and the backdrop of our own celebration is the death of Christ. And it was prophesied before Jesus was born and then Matthew reminds you at least three times, at least two in this text, out of these three prophecies that Jesus is not just simply a, a born savior to lead you away from your oppression. He's actually gonna do something more significant. He's gonna lead you and die for your sins. So as we think about that, I wanna ask you a question and I want you to think about it and it's, it's pretty easy to answer it while we all sit here but it's really difficult to do as we kind of live our lives. Uh, do, you, do, you re, you know, do you know the reason that you celebrate Christmas? And so look um, at what this passage says and it's really, really interesting. So. The first point I'm going to give you is this. Jesus was protected by the Father to ensure that he would die for his people and lead them out of a life of sin. So look what happens. Matthew opens up and he says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Arise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And then he rose and he took the child and his mother by night. And he departed to Egypt and he remained there until the death of Herod. That, that seems crazy and I want to talk about that for a minute, but I want you to see something greater. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. Um, this, this picks up right after the Magi leave and they actually are told in a dream, Herod's going to come. He, his intention is not to worship the child, it's actually to destroy the child. And so they give the gifts that they were gonna have to Jesus. Um, This becomes a catalyst for his escape to Egypt and to provide the things that he needed while they were growing up. And so this beautiful moment, they're warned in a dream that Herod's motive was not to worship, but to kill. And so Joseph takes his son and 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 the mother and they go to Egypt. Now Egypt had become a place of refuge for Jews. We think of Egypt in the Old Testament and Exodus uh, we think about that being the place of a wicked city, and in truth, it, it, was. it was. It was almost this picture of what sin looks like. You want to know what sin looks like? Look at Egypt or Babylon, one of those cities of, in the Bible that give you a picture. Right now, in the time of Jesus, though, it became a place of refuge. It was said that maybe one million Jews took refuge in Egypt because of the great harm that Herod and his sons did to the Jews. 
uh, they, were, they had great wickedness in their leadership and they would just kind of display it. So Mary and Joseph take their baby, likely on a camel, 75 to 100 miles to escape Herod. Um, this, this moment becomes this, this beautiful thing that happens where you're like, oh, they're leaving. God is protecting Jesus. That's good. He's saying, get out of there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna protect my son. And, and if you look at that on the surface, that's good enough. But then Matthew wants you to look deeper. Matthew says, this was done to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. So now Matthew's intent is not that you um, see the father protecting a baby. He wants you to see something more. And so he says, this was actually done to fulfill scripture. And so he quotes from Hosea chapter 11, verse one, where it clearly says the same thing that he recounts out of Egypt, I call my son. And here's the problem. He, he wants you to see Jesus as somebody more than that. That passage, if you were to read the whole passage, shows you something so beautiful uh, in the way that you remember the Exodus. We remember the Exodus as Moses coming before God, are, are coming with, in the power of God against Pharaoh. And he says, let my people go, let my people go. Pharaoh continues to say no and harden his heart. And the last, the last of the plagues is the death of the firstborn, right? And so here, this is, this is now, I mean, Hosea. This is the people that lived in idolatry that willfully put themselves in slavery. This is the people that rebelled against God's goodness. And Matthew quotes and he says, he applies this scripture to Jesus. This is not pulling something out of the air. He says, no, this is, look at who Jesus is. This baby that God is protecting is actually something more. And here's what he says. If you read that text, uh, particularly down starting in verse 10, it says, they shall go after the Lord. He will be like, a, a, he will lure like a lion, a, a lion, not a lion. That's a new animal, a lion. And when he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. Then they'll come trembling from the birds of Egypt, like the doves of the land of Assyria. They will return to their homes, declares the Lord. Ephraim has surrounded them with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah still walks with God and he is faithful to the Holy One. Matthew goes, pay attention. Look into the scriptures. I'll unfold them before you. Who is this baby? He says, this is the one greater than Moses. This is the Exodus, the true and better Exodus. He, he looks at Jesus and he sees something more. He goes, this is the deliverer. This baby who will come out of Egypt will actually be the one to lead the sons out of Egypt. In Egypt, in this moment, he, he looks at it and he says, this is a picture of what sin looks like. So here is what he's picturing Jesus. He says, this is the better and true Exodus. He's the greater than Moses. He's the one who comes from Egypt to lead his people out of Egypt into the promised land. He's the one who's calling his children back home to Jerusalem. He's the one who can stand before God and call the nations to himself. And so he says, this baby, that God protected is actually the son who God intended to call out of Egypt so that he could be, do what Moses never could do. Remember Moses glimpsing into a place that he would never inherit? Jesus is the one who we get to inherit because of his work. He says, out of Egypt, I call my son. Look at this baby. Look at him. And he says, he's the one that's going to end in the plagues for real. He's the Passover lamb slain in our place. He's the one whose blood covers our house. He's the one who will break our bonds and shackles and remove them and lead us out of a life of slavery into freedom, out of death and into life. This is the one who is better than Moses. He is the one who will come and be the holy one. He looks at the baby and he applies the one who's gonna call the nations and free the nations and lead the nations. And he says, this is this baby. 
Well, how can the baby do that if he dies? So the father first, the first order of protecting Jesus was not to ensure that it was a simple moment of love and care, but actually that he would protect them, that he might do something for us that we can't do without him. And so it's that he would ensure that he would die in the place of his people and then lead them out of a life of sin, which would be Egypt. The second thing that we see in this text is that Jesus was protected by the Father so that he would bring the gospel to the nations and gather his people for salvation. And it's beautiful. So then in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 2, it says, Then Herod, when he had seen that he'd been tricked by the wise men, he became furious and he sent out and killed all the male children in Bethlehem in the region who were two years and under according to the time that he asserted from the wise men. Then this fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, a voice heard from Ramah weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they are no more. Herod, realizing that he'd been tricked, he reacted in fear of his throne and he becomes furious and he sends out people now to kill every male child under the age of two and they assess the information for the wise men. Again, history suggests here that there was probably only a thousand Jewish families in Bethlehem at the time. Uh, Due to fear of Herod, again, many people lived in Egypt. There was probably only a thousand that lived there. I have no idea if that's accurate, to be honest with you. Um, For the sake of this story, I'm actually comforted by a lower number. His reaction is then that he moves to get rid of Jesus, and he's not just going to get rid of the uh, you know, the, the new king that has come, but he wants to just get, he wants to ensure that he does so, so he's going to kill every kid. And so they set out and do this. And of course, Jesus is in Egypt. He's safe under the father's care. But then again, this is against the backdrop of prophecy fulfilled about Jesus. So Matthew says, search the scriptures, see why this is happening. And he says, it's out of the prophet Jeremiah. So if you keep reading, you'll see that this text actually takes place during the exile of God's people. And it carries a promise that in those days, God's actually going to come and make a new covenant with his people, where he's actually going to put the law in their hearts, where he will be their God and they will be his people. Around the entire world, he's going to bring forgiveness of all sin. So God removed Jesus from the hatred of Herod so that he might accomplish this, so that he might remove the curse of Adam, so that he might silence the law's condemnation, that he might remove the power of the flesh and the devil in the world system. He might show mercy by forgiving every sin you will ever commit. And, and this says this in the text where Matthew says, this was done to fulfill the scripture. His intention is not that we just we go, cool, That sounds good. We read it. And so in that text, in Jeremiah, uh, this beautiful moment occurs where you see, it says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them out of the hand and to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, that they broke. Do you see the progression of the beauty of this that he says, calling my son out of Egypt to correct what your fathers didn't do, but now I'm gonna make a new covenant with you. And he says, they broke that covenant. And then he says, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. I will write on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall they teach No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord for they will know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. He sees this scripture that happens around the same, in the same context that Jeremiah is quoting, look at Israel and the judgment of God has come on the people. In the same scripture, in the same passage, later on he says, yes, judgment's coming and and it's well-deserved. However, however, 
this holy one. He's going to take it for you, and then he's going to write God's law in your heart. This is the Christ. So twice so far, he said, this is the Christ. Matthew wants us to look deep in the scriptures. And then the next one that he says is really interesting uh, because it is this picture that when Jesus says this, and the second part of this, he wants you to see that he's the leader of the exile. This is done in the midst of the exile. God's people, again, are receiving judgment. And he's like, hey, the days are coming when God is going to move in against us, again, in judgment, and yet it's going to fall upon another. So Jesus would willingly die in your place to end the wall of hostility and ending the curse by bearing our judgment and taking upon our due wrath upon himself. The child was protected in order that he would die in our place, not just die a needless death. He had a purposeful death. Uh, Listen to Galatians. Uh, It says in Galatians chapter four, four, it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then then an heir through God. That's why Jesus was protected. So he would lead you out of exile. Do you realize that from since Adam and Eve, you've been in exile? You've been kicked out of the presence of God. You've been removed from the garden. You have wandered the earth aimlessly, looking for God in everything, looking for peace and hope and joy. And you've, you've been wandering the earth. And it wasn't until the leader of the exile came back that he could bring you the very presence of God in your life. You've been exiled. Everyone on the earth has been exiled with sin, and yet Jesus is the only one to bring us before the Father, pure and clean. The last thing that he says here that's interesting um, in verse 19, he says, but when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, arise and take the the child and the mother and go in the land of Israel for those who sought your child's life are dead. And he arose and took his child and his mother and went to the land of Egypt. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea and place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he lived in a city called Nazareth so that this was spoken by the prophets. Uh, So what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. So the last thing Jesus actually protected by the Father to identify with the rejected and make a way for them to become the children of God. Now, this is interesting. Um, it happened that Herod dies. And when he dies, Joseph says, or an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and said, go back home, like, go home, you're good. And, and when he gets there, he notices that his son, who they say is more wicked than Herod, is reigning. And so in a dream, God again warns Joseph not to go under under the threat of Archelaus who murdered, he was known to have murdered after his father died, he murdered 3,000 Jews at Passover just to, to show his power for their rebellion. And so Joseph doesn't go back under there, under the leadership there, he actually goes to a very obscure place and what's interesting about the, the place that he goes, there's, he goes to this place that would be really uh, rejected, kind of this rejected people. They're not, uh, you're living in, in a sense among people that would have no, nothing good to offer. Societal rejects. And there, it's a beautiful moment. There's no direct prophecy In the Old Testament, that calls Jesus a a Nazarene. However, 
There's lots that imply it. There's not one direct, like the last two that he quoted in this chapter or in, this pa- in the passages I'm dealing with uh, were directly from Scripture. It was Hosea 11.1 1, and then Jeremiah all right, in 31. But in this text, there's not one passage where he says he did this for Naz- to be in, uh, called a Nazarene. He doesn't say that. But it implied all over the, all over the Scripture. Uh, Isaiah 53, you can see lots of, lots of places. Uh, you can see Psalm 20, 22. You can see lots of different scriptures where it, where it pictures a Messiah who will come and you will not, he will not be easily found out. Nothing about Jesus said, look at me, I'm God in the flesh. The people that Jesus hung around throughout his ministry There was nothing that called attention to Jesus being God in the flesh other than his word and his works. Uh, He did not look like God in the flesh. He was hidden in plain sight. And so this this passage, I want to read uh, for you 1 Peter 1, 10 and 12. Listen, it says, Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ was in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you and the things that have been announced to you through those who preached the the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. Um, there's something that, and you know this already, there was two really perspectives of the Messiah that was coming. There was one that was like the warrior king, that's Psalm chapter two. That's Revelation 19. Psalm, you know, we're, we're looking for this, this crazy warrior king who's gonna come in and he's gonna end it all. He's gonna take over, he's gonna take control. Uh, we're, we're going through the gospel of Mark and we see that constantly. Any of the gospels show you the disciples' confusion over what they believe the Messiah is. They are looking at Jesus and they're waiting on him to go into Jerusalem and to take over, to end their oppression, to remove the people that are in power, and then they're going to reign with him over all the earth from Jerusalem. That doesn't happen. That will happen. For them, they were looking at that, and so he, he, had, he offered nothing of substance there, but then... The other version that you see of the suffering servant, which is all over the scriptures, it offers you a picture of of almost a wounded Messiah. He comes in and he identifies uh, with, with those that you wouldn't have think that he would identify with. And he does this all over the scriptures. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He welcomes people who are broken. Jesus is the one who takes upon himself our infirmities and afflictions. He positions God. God positions him with the outcast, willingly identifying with the lowly, the outcast, the broken, the rejected, the poor, the needy, the weary, the the dejected, mistreated and the lowly, those who suffer and in sorrow in the midst of chaos of this world, ruined by sin. That's, that's not the picture that most people would have of God in the flesh. That's not Emmanuel. And the, Bi- the Bible clearly says he was raised among the people who were despised and rejected. His identity that followed him and continued to connect to Jesus was he was a Nazarene, one of no, that held no esteem. And one of the disciples, you know this, he actually comes up to him and he said, we found the Messiah. And then he said, oh really? He said, yeah, he's from, Naz- he's from Nazareth. It's in John 1, 4, 6, 1, uh, 46. And he says, what good can come from Nazareth? You understood? That's like going, we found the Messiah. Where at, where at? He's from Marion, Arkansas. Unless you're from Marion, Arkansas, then I'm sorry. I should have picked somewhere else. I don't know other places. 
But think about that. Whatever place in your mind you'd be like, nah, mm mm. Like, he's from Louisiana. Uh uh-uh. uh. Whatever. It might be Tennessee for you. I don't know. But imagine, like, someone runs up to you and goes, We found the Messiah. And where, where, where? Memphis. Mm mm. You no, know, nah, bro, nothing good comes from Memphis. <laughs> you know, he said, Come and see. Come and see. And that's what this text really invites us to do with this. When, when you see that he's a Nazarene, he goes, he's, he's not connected with a kingdom. He's not connected with wealth. He's not connected even with knowledge. It confused people who went to seminary when they heard Jesus teach. And he's like, he teaches as one of the scribes, but not, I mean, he teaches with one authority, but not as the scribes, not as anybody who's well-trained. He's not the king who's coming to take over? Not yet. What do you celebrate when you celebrate Christmas? Um, Here's what we should have in the backdrop of our mind against all the other distractions and all the other fun things. Like I told you earlier, I love all the stuff. Uh, we, We go Buddy the Elf in my house, but just process for a moment against the backdrop of all the things that can easily distract you from who God is. The reason why this text exists to create an, an, a moment of Jesus could die right after he's born is to remind you that A, it fulfilled scripture, but B, God protected his son so that he might die in the right time, in the place of the poor and the needy and the rejected and the outcast to lead us away from the slavery of sin out, of, out from under the power of the devil and the flesh and the world, returning from the exile to live in the presence of the Father who has made us children and he's forgiven us of every sin and he's given us the power to obey him in our everyday life. That's what it says about Jesus. It says he's the one who's gonna lead you away from from your slavery in Egypt and said, he's gonna one to bring you back home. He's the one that identifies with who you really are. If you really stare in the mirror and you see yourself, you don't see glory. You see weakness. You see your own inability. You see a sad state without Christ's grace in your life. And that's Christmas. Man, you wanna celebrate something, you look at it and go, man, God, protected Jesus so that I would be protected from his wrath that was well deserved. (laughs) That's why Christmas is just as much about death as it is his life. Jesus was born so that he might die. See, God protected him so that I would be protected. So when you think about Christmas, think about this, that Jesus is actually our Passover lamb. Think about he is the lamb that was slain that covered his people. He's the one who leads us out of a life of sin into the presence of God. He's the one that brings us back home from the exile of the garden in Genesis chapter three. Jesus is the only one that could have done all these things and he identifies willfully for the people that are broken. You think that you don't deserve God's love, you're right, and yet you still got it. You think you can't stand before a holy, righteous God? You can't, but you have an advocate and Christmas says we have an advocate that stands before us. If you're, if you're any, any self-awareness, you realize I can't stand before God. What would I offer? And yet Christ, he stands and he said, my blood, the shedding of my blood, my flesh, I stand as your advocate. Look at me, the wounds, they're, they're mine. And That's the beauty of Christmas. Like in all reality, that is the most spectacular thing you could ever have. Because Christmas here is the reminder that God loves us, that he protects Jesus through his life, his death and his resurrection so that he would ensure that he would provide salvation for me. And that's wild to think about. And now out of gratitude, we now live under his rule and reign until he comes back and makes all things new. Tomorrow when you get up, that's the reason you really celebrate. 
the backdrop of everything else. I know, I know there's something under that tree that you're excited about. I know those lights are beautiful. I'm going to turn them on in a minute. I've got a genie. I'm going to turn on my lights before I get home. That 20 foot Santa will be staring at me when I pull in the driveway. But listen, against it all, you have this crazy love from the father that ensures that he protects his son from all of the ills of the world so that you would be protected by the wrath of God so that Christ would take it for you. That's Christmas. Man, that's, that's Christmas. He's your exile. He's you're better than Moses. He's, he's the leader of the exile. And he's the lover of the sinner, the lover of the broken, the lover of the needy. And we should be too now. Let me pray for us. Father, we are deeply grateful um, for your protection of your son. Father, we're, we're deeply thankful that you have done something to ensure that Christ would die at the right time for us. Lord, we thank you for the offering of your son. We thank you for the offering of grace. Thank you that he is better than Moses that he's done something for us that we could never do. Father, thank you that, that he is the leader of the exile, who he brings us away from our place in the world back to Christ, or back to God himself. And we thank you, Father, that he loves the sinner and he identifies with the sinner because we are needy, outcasts, and sinners, and we're thankful that you identify and you love us. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.